Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we have one for Lapras for Elizabeth. Uh, could someone move and second that? Sam and Deborah. All those in favour? Right. Okay, it's carried. Okay. Um, is identification of any extraordinary business or is none? Uh, okay, um, there's no public forum and chairman's report. And seeing sort of first care off the rank that there isn't really a report, but there are probably a couple of comments that I'd like to make. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the staff management and staff for all the work that's gone into organise these meetings. I know it's something that we shouldn't take lightly because there is a lot of work. Um, but we don't either overlap too much on our committees because I think they're four separate committees. And the other thing is that I don't want to lose anything in the middle of it either between committees which I think is going to be important especially for managers to make sure that um, that all these things are being done. The other thing that does concern me in a time when we look at the annual plan and such like and we look at the um, costs of things and um, it, it, it sort of concerns me that we're actually adding more that I'd like to try and keep the cost down as much as possible because even the best way to have the pace for it. And um, 
Uh, the, uh, and part of those costs will be extra staff, as the CEO has said, and also we would have two extra representatives around the table, which I know is being paid for in the near future, but after that, it's something we're going to have to look at. Okay. <clears throat> Manager's report. The, the quarterly update yes. the meeting of the Okay, that's all right. Um, uh, reports for decision. There's the adoption of terms of reference. David? Good morning, everybody. We moment in history, I think, after nine and a half years, it's the first time I've presented from the end of the table. Um, I've got four reports that I want to speak to, Mr Chair, uh, items 8, 9, 10 and 11 on the agenda. And it will be a wee bit repetitive if we're doing the same reports for each of the four committees. So I'll just explain where the, the background of that. So firstly, I'm talking to the terms of reference, which is on page five. And we acknowledge that Council has adopted terms of reference for each for itself and for each of its four committees, along with the other reports I'm going to talk to. And the point of the exercise we're doing today is that the committees have not adopted their own terms of reference, etc. So on pages three and uh, as you were, pages nine and ten of your agenda is the Council terms of reference. And page 11 through 14 is the committee terms of reference. Now, you have all seen these before. You've discussed them. You've had input into them. So this is a machinery motion, Mr Chair, to adopt the terms of reference, acknowledging that this is your binding document. I uh, particularly want to take everybody to page 14, uh, clause 9.1. Just a reminder to this committee and indeed all the others that on an annual basis you will review your terms of reference and at the start of each calendar year you will discuss your work program. So that is uh, just to be kept in mind. Happy to answer any questions, but as I say, Mr Chair, it's a machinery matter. So, I, uh, Mr. Chair, I could introduce no, item number nine. I've got a volunteer to my immediate uh, right to move and second. Um, these are the standing orders again, which have been taken on board by council. Councillors have uh, had input. And the purpose of this is in those uh, standing orders for this committee. Page 28, um, I just seek clarification on uh, you've got two karakia there, it means an opening prayer. We have been very clear in the past that we are a secular organisation and we want the division between state and any religious um, definitions. That doesn't appear to be in that clause there from, doesn't appear to follow that. Right, just take me to where you are. Page 28. The agenda. Thank you, Michael. On the agenda. It's got Karakia yeah. Timutanga and Karakia Whakamotanga means a closing prayer and an opening prayer. We've been very clear in the past that we are a secular organisation. So I just see clarity as to whether that's a typo or whether we need to have further review. Uh, sorry, Mr Chair. I, I take uh, councillors back to page 10, item 2L of the terms of reference, which says all council committees will follow Tikanga and will open and close with a karakia. And that's, yes, that's yes. the alignment back with yes, that. Yes, I hear that, but this is the definition says it's a prayer. 
Oh, I right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but as a pre it's a religious, it's a religious yeah, sure. rotation, yeah. and we have a secular organisation. So there's something wrong there. They're done alone. That's a good point. So happy to uh, with the <clears throat> endorsement of the committee. Remove the word prayer <laughs> from this and the other standing orders. Oh, no, no shame with me. So I can be of assistance, and I, I, uh, I do concur and agree with um, my colleagues. Uh, Brad Miller's um, um, uh, question. Um, and this, it's a karakia is actually an incantation. It's an incantation to, uh, to sum up forth the views of the day and to set forth the direction and then bind us together to achieve um, certain goals. So it would be appropriate that the word prayer is removed and um, incantation or another appropriate word that's fitting of, a, of an opening um, statement. Is was used in that instance? Sure. Uh, oh, yeah. Do you have a, a suggestion? Well, really, the karakia is, a, is an incantation in its in its um, English transliteration, um, and it's you know, is the um, what really the standing orders are um, indicating an adoption of uh, tikanga, and that also needs to be taken into account. Um, words are very powerful, as Brandon pointed out. So as as we move through yeah. these. Um, committees and also through adopting these, it's very important to um, make sure that we understand what they mean. So are we comfortable with the word incantation? Well, we moved to affirmation, didn't we? Yeah. That's what we had at the start of the council meeting, an affirmation. We took out references to religious gods or gods. Um, doesn't matter what religion you are. And, and that's the thing I'm saying is it's not a denigration of anyone's beliefs, but we are secular. And I don't think we should be picking one over the other. Okay. We'll make those changes, Mr. Chair. Um, I was going to try and help out with, um, and I might actually have to ask some advice here, but if I could tell you, where would that sit within our um, our terms of reference and standing orders with regards to starting and um, opening and closing a meeting as well? More to open a meeting. Yeah, so three, Mr. Chair, as I've said, it's on mentioned in the clause, <clears throat> excuse me, clause number two L, where we say that all committees will follow T Kanga and open and close with a karakia. So that is binding on, on the committees. And perhaps if it would be a further assistance, Fanatoki is also a, a proverb. It's also used to enhance, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know, almost a, a saying that's used to enhance the uh, direction or a, a, a um, point. Um, the question is chair. Um, and the question was back to um, uh, the review 9.1.9 of the adoption of terms. And we'll be able to review as you've discussed the, the, um, the purpose and the um, fitness of this committee. Uh, where does uh, the review of these? Terms of reference sit, do they need to be also um, reviewed uh, during that six month period? So, sorry, Mr. Chair, Council's already uh, discussed that and made a decision that the review will be done in July, uh, the first July and uh, first one in July and the second one in January of next year. Uh, third item is on uh, page 100, Mr. Chair. Again, machinery motion. Councils have adopted the code of conduct as presented in the agenda, starting on page number 102. And the purpose of this is to extend that code of conduct to this committee. And finally, Mr. Chair, page 127, um, just confirmation of meeting dates. And uh, back to my previous comment about the review. So for this committee, you will be reviewing your first six months at your meeting of the 9th of August. And these are from the schedule of meetings 
adopted by council on the 14th of December. Any comments on that? Yes, so Dave, just a quick, quick, quick question on that. Um, you said a review of this committee on the 9th of August. Um, is that in addition to the review of the whole process of the committee's overarching? All, all three Institute, all committees, Councillor Dean will be on or about that meeting. That'll be the, the this is the July review yeah, that yeah. we've talked about. So yeah. Some are meeting in July, some are meeting in August. Will it be the committee itself reviewing itself, or will it be so? But just just confirming, there's also there's a review over the whole process of the, which will, which will feed back through to council. Yeah, yeah. Right. Kia ora koutou katoa. It's my pleasure to, ta uh, to present to this committee the quarterly community services and facilities report. The subsequent reports, um, the subsequent report to this report will take you through the planned schedule of reports and will speak further about the quarterly nature of the community services and facilities report. I'll use the opportunity in, in, uh, in tabling of this report to introduce the respective heads and they will speak to their different areas. Um, it also, as part of this presentation, uh, it is understood that 24-7, uh, which is a community group that is funded through a strategic partnerships fund of councils, will provide a short presentation. So um, that may come towards the end of uh, this report. And just for your information, in terms of the reports that are prepared and presented to this committee, we will seek to clarify in this in the subject title whether the reports are for information, for decision, or for recommendation, because there will be some reports that will be on a journey to the full council. And so um, the intent is that anything that is prepared by this uh, community services and facilities group that will end up in our council will, will come through this committee in the first instance. So on that basis, um, I just invite James and Nikki to um, take a seat and to take you through their sections of the community services and facilities quarterly report. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to take you through the sport and recreation um, uh, report that's in front of you guys. Uh, it's been an interesting, I'd say, four or five months for sport and rec um, to have gone through a change management um, in November and in the beginning of November. A uh, new unit was created that uh, is essentially sport around sport liaison and events. Um, and it's been interesting since we've sort of cracked that door open what's been what's been approaching us and, and flooding in so we've been working quite hard in that space i think at the same time everyone's got out of the um out of the COVID mode and back into activity and so we've seen a real strong uptick in uh registrations for link swim registrations for other programs and attendance at facilities so I'll just I'll, I'll allude you to some of those um, those increases in attendance, and also talk about the latest lens swim numbers, which are probably important from a capacity point of view. We are again dealing with uh, looking down the barrel, dealing with some capacity issues at Selwyn Aquatic Centre. So uh, Selwyn Sports Centre has certainly um, had an increase in terms of um, taking holiday programs. Dave and the team are doing a really good job of activating that space during what is traditionally a quiet time of year. Um, so we've had 100 and 116 um, kids enrolled in holiday programs. And in line with the It's My Move campaign from Sports, uh, Sport New Zealand, we've actually targeted young um, and females getting active in sport as well and done the first ever Girls on the Go, uh, Girls Only holiday program, which had uh, 46 attendees, I believe. So that was really good um, and good to see you know, parents really getting behind that. Uh, what we have found during that holiday program is that girls often sort of stand at the back and watch the boys play sport, the bigger, stronger, faster. 
um, and they don't perhaps get as much of a go as when they're by themselves. So it's been good to see that, and we'll con continue that on in line with the sport New Zealand recommendations. Uh, I've visited user numbers at Selwyn Aquatic Centre and Selwyn Sports Centre are also seeing an uptick. Again, it's largely in response to post-COVID um, freedoms that we've got um, and having to have, uh, I guess, you know, number restrictions and, and things like that. Um, and it says that the Selwyn, in the report that the Selwyn Aquatic Centre Learn Swim Programme uh, has 3,250 enrolments. Um, that's actually increased up to 3,416. Uh, that is pushing on the door of the biggest swim school in New Zealand um, and certainly not on the biggest facility in New Zealand. So just putting that in perspective with, with that, that team is doing a tremendous job of making that work in the facility. I think that the changes that we made during the redevelopment mean we can go well above 4,000. Um, but there's a, a, I guess a price to pay in terms of that 4,000 for recreational access to swimming and, and things like that at that time. So we're just going to work through um, some capacity uh, calculations, I guess, with more accuracy this term, and then come back to council with um, some recommendations on where that number leaves us and how long it can we can sustain that for. Our memberships at Salon Sports Centre also um, continue to grow um, in the group. Uh, we're starting to see um, more and more usage of those recreational um, group fitness classes, which is great. Again, it's putting a little bit of pressure on that facility, though, um, especially with netball and basketball increasing their numbers as well. In terms of the operational stuff, one of the big moves we've made uh, operationally at Selma Product Centre is actually move away from CO2. Um, you'll know that there's a nationwide shortage of CO2. Uh, we we kind of saw that coming with the Marsden Point refinery shutdown and um, started to have conversations last year with uh, contractors around changing to a bisulfate slurry, um, which has been installed now or is currently being installed. Um, and we're, we're predicting that it's going to save us around $40,000 a year in operating costs, um, but also more probably more importantly, give us certainty around um, the pH correction that happens um, because of that chemical being introduced into the pool. Uh, and it's po possibly also safer in terms of the delivery trucks coming in and out um, maybe three or four times a week at the moment, delivering it there to off. Um, what's not in the report that I'd like to note is there's been a nationwide, um, there's been a nationwide issue around staffing. Uh, you, I don't know if you've seen Queenstown Lakes District Council, uh, Timber District Council, Wynex District Council, Ashburn District Council, they've all either reduced hours or reduced facility hour operation or close facilities early, seasonal facilities early. Um, it's certainly tougher. It's tougher than previous years for us. Um, we don't we don't feel like we've got the um, capacity and behind us if, if we experience significant uh, sickness or illness. Uh, but at this stage, we're not predicting any reduction in service across, um, especially across the summer pools. This month is always challenging when uni university students go back um, and we, we sort of have to make make things work as best we can through February and, and into mid-March. Um, but at this stage, uh, and whether like this probably helps us a little bit, um, but at this stage, it's, it's going all right. And they've had a, they have had a tremendously busy summer season given the, the warm weather that we've had. Um, the other thing to note, I guess, on the bottom of that report is uh, the time of use fee increase by 45%. Um, that's especially at Selma Aquatic Centre, that power, power bill generally is around $300,000 a year. Uh, so 45% increase in that is quite um, scary to look down the barrel of. We are going to work through what efficiencies we can gain. I think that one of the nice things to note is that we actually haven't had an increase that's increased our power given the new extension, um, mainly because of the efficiency gained in replacing the heat pumps that were already there um, and, and sort of some of the system tuning that had happened. So I'm not, obviously there's still going to be an increase there and we'll work through what efficiencies we can we can get out of it as best we can. Uh, but certainly, again, we're, we're experiencing increased usage, so I can't really see us finding a lot of efficiency um, in that area. Uh, to that, I will pass over to Nikki, unless there's any questions for me. Okay. Yeah, um, quick question regarding lifeguards and things. Do we do anything with the local high schools around 
um, training them up? It's not something I've seen on the program, but I don't know whether it's offered directly. Yeah, absolutely. So um, especially around summer pool usage, we actually go to the, the every, every high school and Nick and Kara, who are the operations team, sit down with um, the school. Uh, yeah, guidance council or at times have talked to the full assembly and pitched their what they offer. A lot of our lifeguards are in that younger bracket now. I think we used to have a lot more high school students and perhaps uh, sort of 20, 25 year olds. I'd say it suggests that we've pushed more towards that younger age bracket okay. uh, because they're just more uh, more available and, and live locally. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yes, um, with the increase in operational expenditure with the electricity costs going up, um, how are your fees setting looking like compared with others? Are we are we charging enough to so we just put our, we need? put our fees up on the first of January? Um, but I think the intention is to keep looking at those annually and probably keep pushing on those annually. Uh, I think our fees are still cheap comparatively to other uh, to other districts, especially neighbouring districts. So I think that's something we can can continually review and and push upwards. Um, I would suggest that there's probably some um, prioritisation in terms of how that looks. I'd say if we could try and, I think, keep learn to swim uh, at, at as affordable cost as we can. I know we've got capacity issues, but obviously we want to teach kids to learn to swim. Uh, but user pays around some of the other programming that may subsidise uh, the operations would be a, a useful. Excellent. It sounds like you're on top of it. Um, interesting comment about um, our fees compared with our neighbours. Do we have uh, many people from out of district coming to use our facility? Do uh, we? We do have a lot of um, people coming to use our facilities from out of district, but not necessarily for a thirty cent cheaper swim. Like, there's no, but more so for uh, uh, trying to get pool space at off peak times and things like that through water polo or artistic swimming and and those sort of programs. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so just picking up on what Malcolm was talking about there, and this may be something for you, Denise, and you may not have an answer for this one now, but I'm interested to know in terms of the ratio between the cost of the, running all the sporting um, events, all the sporting centres right across the district, what our ratio is of um, user, user pays versus um, funded through. Oh, yeah, certainly. So in terms of uh, operational offset? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't want to answer that question. No, no, you, but we can still come back to you. And, and, and that's um, unlike the other question I asked you last time, which was just a pleasure. This is one that's an important one. Okay. Uh, so I do have a second question. Okay, if I can ask, ask you. Um, the, you mentioned about the sports liaison and events coordinator. I think that's what you said. And you've been hit by a barrage of um, events as well as sport liaison, which is great. Um, do any of those requests fall into the performing arts space? No. Uh, and just to clarify, a lot of those, um, a lot of those requests aren't around uh, necessarily event or um, booking support. It's more around infrastructure support, lighting, club rooms, uh, capacity issues, volunteerism issues. Or like uh, that, that's where the clubs are requiring support at this stage. Yeah. And so all of those. Um, Questions for facilities and so on and so forth. They come through 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 that person. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Oh, thank you. Um, so just a couple of questions. One is the sulfate slurry. Is that what's known as the salt pools? So it's uh, salt based, like what they use in Australia. No. So we uh, the salt pool thing is a, is a like a bit of an interesting misnomer in New Zealand. I think uh, what we're doing. In terms of the chlorine production on site, is we're putting salt into um, an electric cell, pushing water through as well. And so, yeah. Yeah. Usually, um, pH of that chlorine is quite high and it makes the pH of the pools quite high, so to bring it back down, we either introduce CO2 or sodium so you wipe off it. Okay. And essentially, without that, we cannot operate the pools because the pH will be out of. Okay. 
Okay, so the other question I had was, um, I'd be interested to know um, in terms of the opening hours um, versus what you would have looked into over the building cost time, um, as in putting solar on it to offset some of those long-term costs with the electricity that you're talking about? Uh, for sale on the product centre? Right. So, the sale on the product centre uh, is one of the more efficient for New Zealand. Right. Um, part of the reason behind that is actually through solar gain rather than solar panel use. Uh, the roof is sloped backwards towards the south, which makes putting solar on there a little bit challenging, but it has been, we have looked at that with Alfin before around the cost recovery of putting in solar. And at that stage, it was, it was, it was two years ago or three years ago during the redevelopment work. Um, it wasn't going to be a sufficient payback to put solar in at that time. Um, but certainly with the increases in technology and betterment of technology, it might be a good time to look at it in the next couple of years. Shane, oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Kia ora tato, Um Thank you very much for the report. Yeah. If I just look at the report and, and take into consideration the note, um, a year to date, uh, previous years has shown in bold, if the figures are higher. Overall, it seems that there's um, great satisfaction with the facilities and that our numbers are going gangbusters and bumpers. Um, you have mentioned the learn to swim term four enrolments, and um, we're pushing the limit of uh, where we are. And we're certainly, by the sounds of it, um, very sought after. And whether that's in relation to the, the fees, we'll, I guess, soon find out. Um, just a question around the uh, demographics of those. And I think um, my colleague has already mentioned that. It would be good to have an idea of uh, the demographics of geographic areas that people are applying for. for and it may um, enhance or bolster um, We'll, as we move through reserves um, and pools, out, uh, outdoor pools, facilities, um, um, relook at things just uh, where that makes um, give opportunity for some of our uh, districts to uh, rules to um, perhaps uh, have leverage to have in new pools of their own in their particular world. So it would be interesting to get some of those demographics of the area, um, perhaps cost prohibitive or barriers that they tend to maybe experience um, to bolster that that uh, uh, review. Um, secondly, that's just on the, the biosulfate. Do you, would you consider that to be a, um, a more environmental and sustainable um, product and and therefore cost effective? And just lastly, on back to the increased OPEX, uh, the, the 45%, I could almost hear uh, Councillor Miller and um, Mary Lemon swinging from the ceiling <laughs> from the bounce out about, about solar power and the missed opportunity we had there. However, I know there's some overlap with these committees, and I think um, um, I'm interested from a uh, performance review of finance, these future enrolments, what that cost could be or is forecasting for, what those numbers are, are equivalent to in terms of a dollar value to offset some of that OPEX, um, but also could be a perfect opportunity for a, a solar investment and to, to offset some of that power for our, not only our facilities, but perhaps our rate payers. So well done on your report. Thank you. Well, just to, um, on a couple of those points, uh, I don't have the breakdown of where people are coming from for them some specifically, but it's actually relatively easy to pull that data because we've, we obviously run a database with addresses and, and things on it, um, so we can pull that um, by area. We do have 88 children enrolled in the Darfield Wind Swim Program on top of that number, um, and that, the only real challenge around that one has been trying to get staff based in Darfield, so we're actually uh, ferrying staff out to Darfield to run that program, um, which isn't ideal, but it's also good to activate that facility and get us heading in the right direction out there and, and seed some uh, more programs, so that's that's really good. Uh, in terms of the biosulfate environmentally friendly, uh, I guess the chemical itself, CO2, um, going into the pools is fine, it's, it's, it's not, to, not doing anything to the environment. What's probably doing a lot to the environment is the delivery of the CO2 back and forward from Christchurch. Um, it's being shipped from Malaysia at the moment, um, whereas the bisulfite we're getting in 45 kilo bags on a pallet is getting shipped once and then it's lasting us for months on end. And so it's all done on site, which is probably where the efficiency is going to. Thank you. Sam? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, just around the, the safety of the operation and the new the changes for the chlorine, uh, there's actually a different handling the stuff, are there any risks to our staff and 
um, just wanting to know that the moment has done so, uh, secretly around the poll use is interested in the Slackbridge, uh, Daffwood and Sheffield polls and their use uh, of the summer of the end of the year, but just anecdotally, what have you seen when I were in Sheffield end of last year or just before the season started? And they were looking to try and increase um, participation there. So just interested in what you've, you've got in that space too. Uh, so in terms of that, the handling of chemicals on site, so on aquatic centre, there's actually no nothing deemed a hazardous chemical at all that needs a handler certificate. Uh, we do have uh, two staff members with handler certificates for other chemicals at other sites, um, especially in Darfield actually because of the, the shape and size of the plant room we need to have. Um, but it's on the product centre, there's nothing essentially that is being handled. So, um, yeah, it's, there's nothing, there's still cautions around it, it's still any safety, but it doesn't need full hazmat or anything like that to handle. Um, in terms of numbers at the district pools, I don't think I've got those in front of me, but I can tell you that um, Sal and, uh, sorry, Southbridge and Darfield have been going really well, Darfield in particular. Um, and obviously they're doing the redevelopment works there yeah, over this winter as well. Uh, so I'm I'm expecting that to continue. Uh, out, in, out in Sheffield, the numbers are strong, especially from the school, still remaining strong. Uh, general use is about on par with last year from, from what I've seen. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, there's only so much of a population out there that... Um, so it's, it's doing its thing, it's taking along relatively well. Just on on Sheffield though, I, I am still waiting for a for a structural report on that pool tub from uh, Pal Fenwick. So we are expecting that in the next hopefully a couple of weeks. Um, I'd just like to make comment on the Sheffield poll is that uh, I think it'd be really hard to increase numbers when we're looking at really short times of usage. Um, so a close at 5 p.m. Um, when there's a lot of families. But it's rather difficult either way. Um, the staffing because then it's not busy at certain times. Um, so, yeah, but I think we need to find a way forward to make it accessible for people um, outside of five o'clock would be good. Thank you, James. I've just got one query, and it's on the air handler duct supports. Where did we actually end up with that, with the contractors? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, so, hang on, probably... Um, believe that we received funds from both architects and the initial contractors. Uh, not that it didn't cover the full cost, but it was certainly a generous contribution towards the full cost. Um, and yeah, steel replacement and steel replacement was put in. So um, yeah, I can't give those exact numbers off the top of my head, but it was in the tens of thousands of dollars of contribution. Yeah. Um, it's nice to be able to talk to you about arts, culture and lifelong learning. Um, I was looking at the stats and really delighted when my eyes went to the bottom of the page and saw that we had a 97.6% um, satisfied or more than satisfied customers. Denise and I will remember that four and a half years ago it was under the 90s, so uh, that's really pleasing. That says to us that we had the most outstanding team working across the district delivering arts, culture and lifelong learning services. So I will make sure that I tell everyone that, that we are at, sitting at that level currently. That's very pleasing. Um, our growth continues and we can see that our growth is actually outstripping population growth. So occasionally we'll look at our, our library members, our members of Selwyn Library and see that that is increasing at a faster rate than the population is increasing. So that is also a good thing. Um, our team are really trying to make library and arts and cultural experiences relevant to our community. So you might not be aware, but we've got quite a large programming team and they are working really hard to deliver Pro, lifelong learning programs across the district that are of interest to all of us and relevant to all ages and happening at times when people can attend them. So uh, we feel really 
part of the work that they're doing and um, we're being watched throughout the country. Hence in the report, we are still receiving quite a number of visitors from throughout the country. They come to see us about uh, change in culture and how we've achieved that over the last three or four years, but also our change in focus in terms of modern services, which is mostly around the types of programs and learning events that we're, that we're presenting. So that, that is fun and it's always interesting meeting people from around the country. Um, I wanted to signal um, the digital digital traffic and digital visits, that continues to climb dramatically. I'm thrilled about that. Our business is around digital literacy. What we learned during the COVID pastime, what I observed is that we've got a sector of people in the 40 to 60 age group who are smartphone users. So when they need to do anything beyond a smartphone, they have absolutely no idea. So um, that's going to be our target group this year in terms of digital literacy, is making sure that people know how to upload, download, do all sorts of things other than just the basic smartphone things. Um, it's a really exciting area to be in. People feel really good when they learn new skills. So usually and ideally they're one-to-one -one conversations rather than group learning conversations. And all of our team do that. We don't, uh, we don't uh, necessarily look for experts within our team. Um, James alluded to the uh, change proposal that ELT led through. That's really great news for us because it's meant that we've been able to recruit some professional experts into our team recently. Uh, for the last few years, we've been focusing on the front line and customer service and being great hosts and pushing out across the district. Uh, we've uh, appointed some strong heritage specialists in the last couple of months. So when uh, our arts, culture and lifelong learning team do our deep dive with you in June, we were looking forward to telling you more about progress in the local history and heritage area. A um, couple of things to wrap up. I'm spending a bit of time on thinking about Leaston's Fotero and uh, working on behalf of James and Ginny and others starting to shape that experience. And um, we're going to talk to you a lot more about that as the year goes by. So that's feeling good at the moment. Um, we received the Patu Tuna from the museum in Tutiara Atia the other week. It's sitting upstairs at the top of the stairs where the lace shawl was. We had to return the lace shawl so that it wasn't exposed to light for too long. So now we've been loaned the Patu Tuna. It's beautiful if you've got an opportunity to go up and have a look at that. It's quite dark at the moment. Uh, that we will keep it quite dark, but we are just waiting to, to lighten it a little. But that's a gorgeous piece for you to read about. It was found in the lake and it's very, very old and of significance. Um, and the other thing is we're about to open a new art exhibition in uh, and you will get be invited to that and that will be exciting because we've done that in partnership with Land here in Lincoln so there could be some elements of um, strong interest for you in, in that exhibition I think that's it Thank you both very much um, I'll move on now and in, in, in the absence of Claire I'll talk to you about a couple of areas in the community and economic development team's activity. But firstly, I'll get Oscar to share with you three documents, which are just about the only paper documents we still produce, having having rationalised a lot of the brochures and the newsletters that we've done previously. So what Oscar's handing out is a sell and visitor promotion uh, a brochure that's just a uh, they just been distributed as well as the latest seasonal brochure. And you'll note that we just had a move away from a term brochure to more of a seasonal brochure that gives us a bit of coverage at either ends of the terms um, and also the seasonal newsletter just for your information. So those um, those documents are noted in the report but just by way of an update I wanted to touch on the integrated youth hub and the Selwyn uh, Youth Council 
and its schedule of presentations. So in terms of the uh, the Selwyn Integrated Youth Hub, which uh, councillors will have had some feedback uh, about previously, which is going to be located in the ex-library facility at the Rolleston Community Centre. I just wanted to uh, draw your attention to some of the the um, work of the Youth Council and the engagement that they've been doing in terms of informing the direction for that uh, integrated youth hub, but also uh, the meetings that are held with the principals of the four secondary schools. So a survey was undertaken by the Youth Council asking the question of young people, what sort of services would would you like would you like to be available in Williston? And in their survey survey, they talked uh, primarily about mental health services, about career advice, health and well-being, sexual health, counselling, and uh, there was an area which we we're describing as other. And with other people, um, respondents talked about self-defence, bullying, vocational skills, interview preparation, mentoring, and life skills, as well as some scootering competitions. Um, and certainly the, the, the secondary school principals had, has, had also identified to us about um, the importance of an alternative education option that was accessible and, uh, and for which they would prioritise early intervention, uh, which is uh, taking a slightly different approach to alternative education than is perhaps uh, the case in some of the other areas, as well as um, the principles highlighted issues associated as well with mental health, sexual health and counselling. So we are developing up the Selwyn uh, Integrated Youth Hub, and I and I'm just going to touch on those uh, programs or services that have been confirmed. Uh, so uh, 298, uh, the medical side of that uh, medical wraparound service will be start, is starting up um, in terms of delivery in the week of the 20th of February with a view to being there twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And in the similar week, uh, they're also going to be locating a youth worker there uh, with particular, uh, I guess, areas of support around uh, mental health and counselling. The, uh, the alternative education service will be starting there on the 6th of March. The Southern Health School has already started there um, and they started on the 13th of February. And uh, we've got, starting uh, towards the end of um, February, early March, we've got Reframe and Stepping Stones uh, who are doing a, a range of activities which are uh, around conversation cafes with young people as well as um, some programs associated with art for healing. So an example of um, a conversation cafe is where they talk uh, about um, about what young invite young people to talk about what they need and what they want to support their well-being. And an example in the arts for healing area is um, vision boarding, neurographic art, and art journaling and the associated activities. Um, as well as that, we've got Youth Town who have confirmed that they will be involved with the delivery of a youth learner licensing course in the start of term two. And there are other discussions underway with other youth uh, providers, including 24 seven in terms of um, their delivery uh, at, over at times out of the integrated youth hub but, uh, conversations have also uh, also actively underway with youth pathways uh, to to Hono, Ta Taonga, Odyssey House, Bradford uh, Arts Clubs and Qtopia. So that's happening in terms of the integrated youth hub. So there will be a time uh, we would anticipate in April, May, where there will be a, a more formal uh, opening. But in the meantime, we're just getting people in and getting organisations started as, as we can uh, secure them. Um, and the other area that I was just wanting to touch on is, while it's not in this, the, the report that is following this report, we'll talk about a schedule. 
of reports that are going to come to council um, uh, to committee over the course of the, um, this calendar year. But the Selwyn Youth Council has some tentative dates that they've asked um, the uh, presentations to be given to the Community Services Committee. Um, so the first one is proposed to be Wednesday the 29th of March, um, then again Wednesday the 21st of June, and then finally on Wednesday the 1st of November. So that generally will take the form of a video presentation, but they will attend in person if they are able. So that's missing from the schedule of schedule of reports um, that you will receive um, after this report. So um, uh, as we wrap up, I'm just invite Anna um, to come up to the front. Nat, Anna, in um, normal course of events, is the assistant manager to Ginny Bowden, who's the head of venues and events. Uh, Ginny is, well, she was here yesterday. Um, she's actually nursing an arm that's been broken in a couple of places um, uh, from a fairly innocuous activity at her home um, some weeks ago. So she's laid up, but we have Anna here who's who's just going to uh, touch on the venues and events reporting. And Councillor Dean, just in response to your comments earlier, yeah. Some of the questions um, you, you're interested in around facilities, and while James has reported to you in terms of the sports centres, uh, the sports sorry, the Salem Sports Centre, and also the Aquatic Centre, and also talk to you about the fact that there is a, um, a more active involvement of his team in the open spaces, uh, which tend to be the sports fields. The um, venues and events team is more focused on the actual community centres and halls and the 28 that we have across the district. And so, so I imagine some of your interest will be this similar in terms of the target of, um, of the, this team. And so just um, touching on the points that you made earlier, we do have a revenue and financing policy which drives certainly um, um, a lot of our activity in terms of meeting those those targets. And I just and so we're trying to be very transparent in terms of the progress that we're making around those various community centres and halls, noting the fact that some are coming from a, a long way back because they are ones that have transitioned to councils direct management over the last. 18, 18 to 24 months for some of them. And in some cases, we council have not received any revenue um, uh, funding from them for some time. So we're making progress, and, um, and we'll hand over to Emma to talk to you a little bit about the highlights of what's been happening. Um, kia ora. Um, the venues and events team now manage 23 community facilities. Um, with Wilson and Kalinchi come uh, now fully on board. Um, and we now have a team of over 20 dedicated um, to looking after these facilities and um, the user groups. Uh, year to date, we're tracking up 51% um, on bookings. Um, mind you, we've just got to take into account that the year prior, we were in a lockdown in the August. Um, our large sites such as OEC and Rolston Community Centre um, are consistently um, making 30 to 50% of um, Operating expenses and some of our key performers are the likes of um, Dun Sandal and um, Lakeside. Dun Sandal, um, in the last six months in particular, has um, seen a big lift post um, post COVID with the um, a lot of corporate clients returning. Um, where this year we went out to both current and potential hires at the same time for expressions of interest um, and saw a huge lift um, in this. I think that was a mix of. Um, sort of confidence post COVID returning and also in particular at Rolleston Community Centre, we were up um, from 55 to, um, expressions of interest to 50, uh, 85 this year. So I think that's also just um, shows the growth of Rolleston as well. Um, this year as a team, we're um, focusing on that um, new and innovative ways of um, generating income, not just um, our sort of stock standard hire and going through um, and talking to our customers and seeing what that looks like and what they would require. Um, 
Yes, James identified as well. We've seen um, staff shortages as well. However, um, in advertising roles since coming back, um, coming back post Christmas, we've actually seen a lift in applicants as well. So hopefully that will all change this year. Um, that's probably it for me, unless anyone has any questions. Um, it's all right. Sorry. My apologies. To me. Shame. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shrew. Um, in terms of um, alternative um, commercial return or return, um, you've said you've surveyed that. Has there been any interest in um, looking at the perhaps the facilities that don't quite hit the mark or uh, haven't had good patronage? Yeah. Uh, would you consider putting on targeted events at those facilities or is there a way to do it close to larger population? And then spread that cost throughout the. So we've started to look at, um, yeah, we've started to look at some of the smaller facilities and how we can activate those, and then change those activation, convert those activations into higher posts, so it's not just one off. Um, so um, that is something that's definitely on the cards this year, and also looking at some of those small, small and more rural um, towns, how we can activate, um, working closely with the ACL L team and um, Active as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to go back to Nikki and say thank you for your report and that um, you guys have done an amazing job and I know that the Edge Connector vehicle is well appreciated out in my area. It, it's amazing and you guys are doing a great job. Um, and yeah, well done to you guys too because managing all of this is um, a relatively big job. I was just wondering in Appendix 1, will we see a move of West Melton into the Melvin Ward and Readens into the Springs Ward with a change? And boundaries? Yes. <laughs> um, yes, we will. So um, as far as our team that manage and look after them as well, um, both the Mel Melbourne and um, West Melton are sort of emerging as the northwest. So we've got Kelly who looks after um, West Melton as um, the operations manager of Northwest, and um, Claire who's and looks after the Melbourne centres is the our senior events coordinator out there and of Northwest as well. So they're going to be working closely together. Cool. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> um, just a couple of things. I suppose I was just looking at your spreadsheet of income and expenditure and just focusing on my local community centre. Uh, it's trucking along sort of expenses seem um, seem okay. But all of a sudden in December it goes from you know sort of three to four thousand expenses up to twenty nine thousand. It seems to be a large jump. Is there mm -hmm. something that that we should know about there that um of OPEX that that, that is something I'd need to get back to you on in that one. While I'm on the subject, um, I guess this, the usability of some of these facilities, just for users, um, for example, it, it's quite an embarrassing moment at the <coughs> Todapu Community Centre gets quite a lot of use as a funeral venue, which is great. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, unfortunately, the electric double doors are not wide enough for a casket and pallbearers to travel through, so they walk out solemnly, get to the doors. All of a sudden, they have to somehow get to the back of the casket, <laughs> try and manoeuvre it through the doors. And I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but there's a major issue. Yes, um, that had been brought up, I think, in the last year, so definitely something that will be, will, will be yeah, addressed. Yeah, maybe yeah. I should talk to you offline. There's a couple of other issues that need resolving. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. But if you could come back to me on Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you for your report. Um, just one issue that I... Um, like to bring to the attention is with regards to um, I guess the extra um, business health checks, um, the learning clubs um, just say social um, procurement with regards to our community are we actually gaining any support in the area of mental health for example from central government to actually help um, fund some of these projects or is it solely based on our ratepayer and fee being paid? So I think I'll pop a bit on to the next. Thank you. Um, what you touched on, Deborah, is a, a really good point. It probably sits more in the area of Heartland, which is not not an area that um, Anna is leading. But we are in the process of negotiating a contract uh, with MSD for the delivery of Heartland Services, which is primarily focused on encouraging central government agency service provision uh, into Selwyn District. 
and following on from that, um, encouraging central government funding of accredited NGOs delivering services into Selwyn. So that's the intent, and um, and it's a work in progress. We have made some gains with some of the organisations that are funded by by central government, but I guess with that's uh, some of the intent with the integrated youth hub, but also with the heartlands is very much about getting central government to come to the party in terms of both service delivery, but also funding services um, delivered by NGOs into Selwyn. And would it be possible that when that actually happens that we um, ask for a budget sheet um, so we can actually understand how much of the cost is actually being picked up by our ratepayers, how much is actually being picked up by the Heartland Fund um, and how much is being contributed by um, fees and charges and um, and any other externalities that, that may fall through because um, it's just important to understand that um, local government is, you know, is trying to forge relationships with central government at the moment. Um, and part of that is trying to understand what does local government actually deliver um, that should be actually funded by central government or more funded by central government if they want to actually get local government to pick up and actually do this work. So um, I just like. Um, some sort of record keeping um, to be available. Um, I don't know whether that's appropriate or not, but I'm asking for it. Okay, um, just an, your point is noted. I guess from our, our perspective, this application that, uh, was specifically for funding from central government. And while it's not a lot of funding, we're already in the business of doing a lot of this. This is actually getting central government to come to the party and to contribute to some of the things that are already happening. So it's, um, I'm, uh, yeah, it, it wasn't our intention to, to go into the detail of the contract negotiation, um, but certainly we will um, do a much more focused report on Heartlands at some point across the, the, the calendar year so that you will get a bit more, hopefully a bit clearer sense of, of what uh, government is contributing towards? Sorry, because there's other projects um, within this book that I note that there are charges, you know, for, um, and it would be really good to understand how well patriated they actually are and whether the charges and the people attending actually do cover the costs. So, um, you know, I, it just would be, just would be helpful to understand that, that, you know, we are, I'm spending the ratepayers' money prudently in this particular area. Okay, sorry, I didn't realise you were specifically focusing on um, individual events that were listed in the brochure. Nikki, well, you got your hand up. Did you want to make a comment, Nikki? Yes, I thought you Oh, thank you, Denise. Um, I'm pleased to say that when we have Christchurch people coming out to our programs, we charge them and we make a lot of money. So I wanted to tell you that before, if you'd asked me a question. We actually make a lot of money out of Christchurch people. We are a destination, and I think that's lovely. But when they come and learn to make gin, and they're really envious that we're teaching them to make gin, we make sure that we cover our costs through charging them. We do it, by, in that instance, by library membership. But also, uh, uh, particularly Denise, with arts, culture, and lifelong learning revenue, the bulk of it is coming from programming. And so, those events that you'll see in the term booklet, where there are charges, we've purposely done that so that we can, within our traditional library sense, maintain free services in terms of literacy in, in those areas. So, we're making really good money on it. Yeah, really, really good, good money, money, actually. It's probably one of the things that our visitors from around the country are checking out. Yeah. Is that right? That, that's fine. It would, it's, it's really handy to see a balance sheet to know that we're, we're actually going to be making money in that yeah. area for the future. Um, the other question I did have was around finance um, and the budget. Um, and I'm just, I'm just really um, curious about our income 
um, and our expenditure in total for these facilities. Um, but then there's some anomalies that probably I'm struggling to understand with regards to um, Lakeside Hall, as an example in November, we've actually got an income of 6,400 and an operating cost of um, 18, 1,870. And in October, we had an income of 4,464 and we had an operating income of 4,748. Um, and there's those anonymies through the, the budget. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, you know, how those operating charges, when the facility's not really being used, can be so high. Another one is um, Springston income for November was 5,553, but the operating charges um, was um, 2,089, and that increased from 1,260 last month. So um, with more usage. So I'm I'm just a little bit lost as to how to read these income and expenditure um, stats with regards to the to the usage. <clears throat> um, I can talk to that. So just for the, the specific ones you've mentioned, um, Lakeside's a little bit different because it hosts a lot of weddings. We um, see two to three weddings a month over the summer months, um, and those weddings get paid for in advance, which is different to a lot of our other centres. So um, that's where you may see a low amount of income, but the facilities actually been utilised that month. They would have just paid for it earlier on. Um, in terms of Springston, um, where you'll see sometimes lower income, that'll, that is when we do undertake some of our maintenance or any issues that may, when there's not users in the hall, and that's when we will undertake those things. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, through you, Mr Chair, I think potentially there are a number of questions associated with Appendix 1 at staff level, we've agreed that we need to review what is there and uh, mm -hmm. provide some, uh, I think, correct A, some of the anomalies, and B, just put some uh, reading notes to that, so we'll make sure that that's addressed prior to the next meeting. Thank you. That's me done. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, is there a consideration for the smaller underused town halls, the likes of Southbridge and Green Park, for the council to host a public included meeting to see if the public have ideas on how we can address many of the areas of concern and the deficits in relation to the use of these halls? Um, I, I, I'll invite Anna to make a comment. I think in, if you're saying in general um, are they used for public meetings? They're certainly available for public meetings in terms in terms of that. And we are getting customer feedback all the time, and we do an intensive um, a customer engagement survey annually, asking for suggestions about how we might utilise and what services and what, what what activities they'd like to see. And so we get regular customer feedback as well as an annual feedback that that does drive a lot of what we're doing. And but I think Anna was what Anna was talking about before, which was the idea of uh, testing and trialing a, a, some different initiatives as a one-off to see if it becomes something more ongoing is certainly part of the priorities. But you might want to comment on that, Anna. So we're definitely looking at different ways to um to, att to attract new people and get that feedback. Um last year when Southbridge reopened um post sort of the renovations, we had a family fun day, open day, and was able to talk directly um, to the community there as well and get ideas about who wanted to use the halls and how. So um, that was quite a successful day and something we may, we may look at running out across the other, um, some of the other halls as well to um, yeah, meet a number of pe different people from different groups across communities. Sam? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think the conversation on this matter um, highlights the change in the, the way that these committees will be used. I, I find it um, sometimes really frustrating uh, that we're looking after $2 billion worth of community assets and then we think about what $400 as a line item within a report um, really means, whether it should be 400 or 600 So I know that we all care about these facilities and we want to know the information. Uh, and we want to we want to dig a little bit deeper, but we, we're going to need to find a space where we're not getting down into the operations of a particular facility to think about what's enabled or not um, as we sit in these committees. I think 
Um, and think about David, I agree, the staff um, and, and the reporting, the commentary uh, around what's in here, just to provide that, that analysis for us ahead of, ahead of the meeting. Um, the things I was interested in is that um, I really love what we're doing here. Uh, it's so great to see what we're doing uh, on a seasonal basis. Um, particularly wanted to highlight the Pride events uh, that sit in here uh, and think that uh, I'd like to encourage us to be doing more in that space. I think Pride is one of those things that highlights an inclusive community. I mm think -hmm. if we could do more in the um, yeah, LGBTQIA rainbow space, it would be, um, yes. it, it just talks about the type of community someone is and that we're becoming. Um, so the two of you here are good, but I'd like us to see more and for staff to lean into that. Um, I know March is only just around the corner, so maybe it's thinking about 12 months away. Uh, and the other part is, uh, in the other brochure, stargazing is promoted and highlighted in here. Uh, and in, well, after the election, when, the first, when we got together first as a council, we talked about um, Dark Sky Reserve for Craigie Bend Valley and for Taimutu. Um, we're again promoting stargazing here. Uh, as a council, we said that's the direction we want to go. So I'm interested um, in reporting back to probably this committee around um, how we're progressing through. Uh, that dark sky reserve status and what that's going to entail for us uh, moving forward. Thank you. Do you want to stand? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I hear you, Sam. Um, I guess perhaps we're phrasing it wrong. I suppose it's more about direction from the council about the income required. I mean, it's ironic that we spend a lot of time saying we want money out of these things. But then when we go and hire it, we always say it's too dear. <laughs> so, so we want to bob each way. And I think what I hear from my community is, especially as they've fundraised a significant amount of money to have a local facility, they want the fees and charges kept to, to a reasonable level, which enables them to use it more often because um, we're already seeing people choosing alternative venues because they perceive our venues are too dear, um, whether they're staffed or otherwise. So the challenge is here is, is what, what are these facilities for? Uh, for community use and while we might want to get a modicum of money back the reality is they're going to be there with the doors shut and uh, if we don't get people in there so this is normally against my grain but i'm actually in favor of being you know making them the fees more more sort of sustainable so people get in there but the, the more, more of a question i think i suppose and it's probably appropriate that i raised it the first question is is probably more for denise is are we is your team aware from the governance group of what the parameters of reach are, I suppose, because we're starting, as Deborah said, we're starting to further engage, for want a better word, in social services, which were the domain in the past of you know, tertiary education, of workers' education, high school night classes, um, open polytech and all those things. And it's just incremental. And in my time at council, I've seen us gradually transitioning. And that's OK if we all are on board with that. I've got no problem with that, but we don't seem to have ever had a stop and pause discussion where we go, are we in this space? Who else is in that space? Are we taking someone else's gas? Is it a, you know, is it the, is it the politics space? Is it the high school space that should be providing those services? And I, the concern I raise is that um, other organisations will certainly let the council take this space up because they're not performing or can't fund it or whatever. And so... I would like us at some stage to have a, a defining parameters discussion where we say, what do we do here and what don't we do? Because in the absence of governance direction, it's difficult for Denise to say, well, how far is my scope of operations here? Um, and how far can I go with this? What is my budget? I mean, this is the first time I've heard this morning uh, like that the 24-7 youth is funded by the Strategic Partnership Fund Council. It's never come to the... To, that if I'm hearing it right, that's never come to us as a governance group saying this is a strategic partnership and we're going to fund it. Mine, what I heard was that we've got a trial situation at Rolleston Community Centre in the interim providing space for user groups on a on a temporary trial basis, and I hope these groups are aware of this, uh, <laughs> as we ponder what the final use, ultimate use of the community centre might be, and it may be completely different. So there's a range of questions there, Denise, and it's sort of that pause and let's tell us um uh, uh, the, the points you raise i guess for me fall into two areas one is around are we in the business of delivering social services well i can tell you categorically we're not what our role is is around advocating facilitating coordinating and um and i i guess from our point of view the heartland services is 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 a mechanism by which we can get central government to come to the party um, so we're not 
and getting into the business of central uh, of social service delivery with the heartlands for example it's to try and put the asset on some more central government agencies to get out here and the and some resource through those central government agencies to the ngos that are uh, uh, willing and able but aren't resourced to fund services out here so we're not getting into the business of social service provision um and unless the council decide otherwise so that's that's the position around that. Just in terms of the um, strategic partnerships funding, and um, and and we're starting to move into the presentation from twenty four seven. I didn't. There was no connection between this funding and the integrated youth hub, and I'm sorry if what I the fact that they are involved in some of those discussions may have confused things. So that wasn't the intent. But the strategic partnerships fund. It was. Um, all of those decisions were actually council decisions. Yeah. They were, and, but they are coming up to the end of, I think, it's a three-year funding arrangement. Yeah. So three years ago, um, there had been a proposal to not fund um, specific NGOs, but rather to put them into a fund called Community Grants Fund and to administer that in a contestable process in an ongoing basis. And at that time, council was was um, was comfortable with some of that funding going into the grants, but wanted to retain its current investment in some specific named NGOs. And so that happened at a council meeting, and um, and so we've been monitoring um, the, the, those those in NGOs and their performance um, subsequently. Um, and we no longer put that, them in as line items, which has had been the historic basis of which those um, NGOs got funded, was they became line items in a report that went out as part of the um, annual plan and long-term plan process. They're now captured within a, a bucket of money so that they, it is, a, uh, I guess, it at least gives the council an opportunity to review and reflect on at least a three-yearly basis whether or not it will continue to invest in those particular NGOs as, as strategic partners. So that's, yeah, I guess I take no responsibility for that other than to be the agent of council in terms of that particular funding allocation. Um, but if, if that's it, we, thank you, thank you, Anna, and thank you for coming up for those subsequent questions. The last item it was just um it was just to invite 24 7 to come up oh sorry sorry um so if, yeah okay i just wonder whether you did that just because i was speaking next <laughs> hey uh i'll just grant uh, thanks for asking that question that's a great question i mean um we just heard that 85 um people uh put into to use the uh Walton community center now, whilst it's not the only place in that area, I accept that. Grant reminds me of that all the time. Um, but, <laughs> but there is a the question comes the use of that space is an important space. It is the only community space that just in this great community. And really, that's all I wanted to talk about. Now, I'm surprised anyone here that I'm here because of my support for the performing arts. I don't think there's a big person in the room who would be surprised to hear that. Um, and I want to talk about performing arts for a moment. And I know this is, this is, a, there, is a, there is a question coming. But I'm going to make a small statement first. Um, performing arts covers our entire community. It is thicker and deeper than any sporting event that we have. There are more volunteers in performing arts, there are more participants in performing arts across the board than there is in sports. There is more, there is, um, We've had reports done by the last council, important reports about how we facilitate the performing arts. And they weren't. Yeah, not to do because again, they revolve around that. A lot of community centre. Um, what they also highlighted was how important the performing arts are to our community. <coughs> but I don't see anything about performing arts in your report. Uh, there's nothing in there. Um, about key plans. There's many, many things in here about how sporting things are going to be um, uh, progressing, including in the area of community strategic plan, 
where the Sport and Recreation Centre wasn't big enough. So they've even gone into there about sport and recreation and play plan and about how we're going to be developing foster park and how we're going to be sports, sports field lighting. So these things are, are, are reflected because as a community, they are important. And I accept that sports is important to our community, as is the performing arts. And it's a time that as a community, as, a, as, rep, as, as governors of our community, we start to look at the things that our community saves us. And there's not one of us here that represents the community where the performing arts is a bit. And um, I guess we need to have a starting point. So the starting point is how do we get the performing arts reflected into your community? At the moment, it's, it's, um, we, uh, we, it's because of things of the past, it's um, placed in with heritage and the physical arts. Um, and it's one um, well, uh, you know, interesting big powers that don't really fit so well together. Um, and it certainly can't be fitted in with sport, although ironically the sports, a lot of sports people are the performing arts people too. That's the, um, so I think it needs to have some, some to be reflected in here as a thing. So my question is nice and nice, nice and simple. Um, what do you think about what I've just said? And secondly, can you show me in the report where, where, where that, the performing arts sits? I guess traditionally, um, just in terms of um, telling the story, there have been examples over the past in terms of the reports that community services and facilities and arts, culture and lifelong learning has in particular, where it's had a particular focus on, for example, public arts or different um, different types of the activities in that space. Um, but I think the, the point that you raise is a very valid point, and it might be worth considering having that conversation when we talk to the next report, which is a schedule of reports that are um, due to come before this committee over the next 12 months. And the fact that we're, we are proposing to bring a community wellbeing strategy to this, uh, uh, to this um, committee on its way to council, and whether or not the brief for that needs to be broadened or whether in fact there's a gap in terms of things that we should be thinking about um, strategies around. So I think there's certainly an opportunity for further discussion about that if that is a desire of council. Yeah, I guess it goes, um, I mean, there's, there's no surprise uh, to me that the uh, things like um, performing arts are in that um, um, mental health space. I mean, uh, having to be done as, as long as they have, you, we, there is something for everyone in the performing arts that is blind. You want to you want to be involved in, in, in a group. We don't care whether you can kick a football over a bar. We don't care how fast you can run. We don't care if you can swim four thousand meters. You want to be you want to be involved. You can be involved. So there is some psychosocial welfare things that, that fit into that space too. And it's a and as responsible governors, I think that we uh, should at least have our um, managers presenting to us all of the, the depths of the community things. So I, my question still, still, still remains, is there anything in the performing arts in this report? No, the report is as you see it. Um, yeah. It doesn't mean that, that across, the schedule, that across the schedule of reports yeah. that you might not see a more in-depth report or an in-depth presentation, and we'll have an opportunity to talk about that in the next report after a break. Thank you. Oh, thank you, uh, and I'm not taking a second bite of it. It was actually just to circle back to Nikki. That's a question. So, thank you very much, Nikki. Um, the local government uh, act for uh, councils and councils to operate within the four pillars. So, I think in terms of crowd questioning and parameters, because I too uh, receive an alarming, well, more and more concern around the affordability of using uh, facilities, especially for our seniors. So perhaps a workshop on the mix, the correct mix of our uh, pillars. And also, you know, I've often thought about a gold card for our senior citizens here in the, in, in the um, Selwyn district, some type of thing like that, where they can feel a bit more appreciated for the contribution they made over the period of time. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, second, I just want to say thank you very much, Nikki, for your report. Um, arts, as my learning colleague over there has just talked about, is, is very important. And we've also made a number of contributions. I've got a question around 97% uh, satisfaction is absolutely outstanding. Well done on that and everything that you guys run. Uh, how many uh, were surveyed? And secondly, uh, public art, uh, there was a discussion around that, taking back to Leaston. At the moment, there's um, uh, the Lions in collaboration with uh, your team. And thank you very much. A big kudos to um, 
of the collaborative uh, nature of which Tuamua has also come along as one of the and blessed the site. So it's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful collaboration between, between everyone. Um, the in particular the fund, the twenty five thousand dollars that was allocated to each of the wards, I uh, would appreciate uh, a greater understanding of where that fund sits if it's uh, being allocated to that particular project or whether there's opportunity or scope for for more in the region, I think that's fantastic. Um, the youth report, I think it's it's absolutely standing. Sam on a number of occasions has said that uh, the third of our, our population is a, a youth, basically, so, and they are our future, and the more that they're um, cared for, looked after, on the mental health space, physical space, I congratulate all of our, our people here for, for the efforts that they put into it. My concern is uh, more likely, so I'm seeing they can see it, just our rural, and um, Maria has mentioned the connector, the, the, our rural communities, um, and you know, rightly so, from a governance perspective, whilst in this rural, so we've got a good starting platform there. It's pushing out into our small, remote communities. These, these facilities are it's some of our youth engaged in perhaps as one of those underperforming facilities. Sure, thank you. Um, just in response, and, and Mickey, I'll, you might want to grab a microphone and, and um, further respond. So, I'll just this is an opportunity to respond to the question which was around public art and if, and some funding that was allocated by uh, to some decisions that were made by council about uh, based on the report with some recommendations about some investment in public art in each of the wards and so um the an inquiry came in to uh, Nikki and, and Nick, Nikki's team um followed that up to say did councils was council's decision to invest in the Lions project in Leiston, and the answer was no. The council decision was to put public art in um, alongside the Wairua Whotero project. The funding hasn't been uh, expended, and and it's likely that um, for a public art investment, it would require more than that, that amount of money. So it is possible, as I understand it procedurally, for um, a, a councillor, a, a report to come in and, and propose an alternative use for that fund in the future. Um, but um, the officer's report was the, with, with the officer's report and the council's decision was that that public art fund be allocated toward uh, Waikora Whatero, and that's the that's as it stands today. But Nikki, you might want to add something to some of the other quick. Thank you, Denise. Uh, 800 respondents to last year's survey. So high levels of um, response to for that. Um, and we've just put the Christchurch Symphony Orchestra Phil for three performances at Tiara Artia very soon. Yes. So I will email you the date. I am really excited. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping to just wrap this up, but just generally thank you to everybody. I mean, as just generally, I'm quite excited. I'm excited about the youth hub. I'm excited about all the events and everything that we see in here and the sports and the house and the music and the culture. Um, because I guess, yes, there's this debate around how much we should be paying, how much we should be facilitating, but we're still in that really awkward space that we're too close to Christchurch. We're too far away from Ashburton and there is this gap in the middle that nobody else is going to take care of apart from us. So, yes, I agree that it would be great if somebody else was organising it and it didn't fall down to council uh, staff and facilities, but that's literally, we have the facilities. We've got wonderful people who are going out and finding, out, finding people who are doing the money. They've got the funding, whether it's from, count, from central government or wherever else, and just making sure that, A, it happens in the places we need it, and then you get these fab brochures that tells everybody about it, and we can make sure that people go along. Um, yeah, that's about it. And also, I very much enjoyed a mocktail workshop the other day, which was fantastic. So nobody got drunk, but I did see several people afterwards who realised during the course of it that if they'd signed up or they'd used their library card number, they could get it for $10 cheaper. So they quickly rattled off to, to sign up to the library. Um, but yeah, we, we, we do need to facilitate this stuff and we're doing a great job of it. And um, thank you, everybody.
just just one comment from me, and it's um, I'm getting quite a lot of feedback on the work that we're doing in helping people fill in forms, which is something that was in the report, and I'm getting quite a lot of, and I've used it myself actually, and it was really worked well because it was something that I wouldn't have been able to do at home. So I think that's really worthwhile. Just a question. Seeing a lot of the forms that I understand are being filled on a government form, so are we getting anything from the government to actually help pay for some of these um, things? That's Heartlands. Yeah, that's, 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 that's part of that. That's that. what Heartlands is about. Yeah, it's about being support financially council to make sure that there is staff available to help people fill out government forms, et cetera, et cetera. So you might want to add something to that, Nikki. What I wanted to add to that is we have had help for a number of years from the Department of Internal Affairs through the National Library provision of Wi-Fi and Chrome books and Chrome stations and printers. So that's a long-standing relationship that libraries are packed with National Library. So Okay, thanks very much, Nikki. Um, so I'm, I'm mindful that um, uh, the chair is interested in a break, and um, but I, I was just wanting to use the opportunity to um, give some time to 24-7 who've come along today and um, to let them talk to you about what they've been doing in Selwyn District, but also to share with you some of their observations and views about what they are seeing in terms of the topic of young people and issues that affect them. So thank you very much for coming along today. There we go. Uh, and on behalf of uh, Youth Southwest Christchurch Trust, the Lady Youth Trust, Out There Youth Trust, Southern Wairewa Youth Trust, and Arise Church. Uh, these are all trusts or services that provide the 24 7 youth work um, kind of program in schools. So I'm going to talk a, a really brief amount about. Um, what 24-7 is, the funding that we've received, uh, and then I'm going to let these guys tell you some stories who are on the ground youth workers about what it is working with young people in our region. Now, uh, first of all, thank you so much for the time today, and I will be brief so that we can get some morning tea. That sounds like a great plan. Um, but an opportunity to report back to you about some of the work that our team have been doing serving the Rangatahi in this region. Our teams work in Ellesmere College, Ralston College, Ralston School, Lincoln Primary, Lincoln High, uh, and we're just uh, working with Spunston School as well. Let's start with that saying thank you to Selwyn District Council for your ongoing and generous support for 24 7 youth work in the Selwyn region. For those of you less familiar with 24 7 youth work, uh, 24 7 is a Christian faith based charitable trust that runs a network. So we're a network of local churches, schools, and youth trusts, all listening and working alongside young people through the often uncertain, difficult to navigate, disappointing, and sometimes full of joy thing that we call life. In a few moments, some of the team are going to tell you about some stories of how they work with young people on a day-to-day -day basis. Our youth workers are predominantly employed 10 hours a week uh, in their school context, and each day can look totally different depending on the young people they're working with, the needs of the school, the um, community, and what the, the specific young people that they might come across at lunchtime. How we're funded, uh, our funding comes from three areas, which enables us to be uh, to collaboratively share the load uh, of empowering our of empowering people, support and empower uh, young people. So schools contribute twenty five percent, churches contribute twenty five percent, and then youth trusts source the um, remaining fifty percent of which the council is a part of contributing towards that. Uh, we're so grateful to the council for your support over many years and 24 7 youth work in enabling us to be on the ground engaging and partnering with young people to see them thrive so we're here um, we're here to report to you about the three-year multi-party funding agreement between council and our teams uh, the council generously set aside for its district plan seventy thousand dollars and so we're reporting on the year 1st of July 2022 to 30th of June uh, 2023. Of course, we've not finished that part, so we're just on the first six months of that. Uh, 
This is the second year of the three years that are funded, and we're reporting to you about the first six months of that current year. So just uh, very briefly, these are, oh, that goes very quickly. These are our teams in Ellesmere College. Yeah. And sorry, yeah. Rolston School, we've got Wilson Mana, uh, Rolston College, and we've also got Nick in there as well. Uh, in Lincoln Primary School, in Lincoln High School, and then we're currently working on getting another youth worker. Christy was in there, but uh, getting a new youth worker there soon. So some stats about some of the work that we're doing. Young people interacted with, this is in the last six months, 15,000 uh, in groups. So when the young people have gathered together in groups, is 15,347. Mentoring one-on-one, -on -one, youth workers mentored one-on-one, -on -one, 2,147 young people. Youth worker hours in school, uh, this is the total number of hours in school, 2,395. And young people who attended events, uh, 3,243. So I think in the last six months, those numbers kind of speak for themselves for the incredible work that these um, sort of seven to nine youth workers, depending on, on the staffing capacity that we have at the time, uh, do with young people on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's enough from me. Let's hear some stories. I'm going to introduce uh, Anika, who's at Ralston School, who's going to say, I'll just tell you a little bit about what it's like youth working. Cool. Um, I think it's actually quite crazy because last time I was in here, I think I was repping just being a student and just the influence that um, the youth workers had over me. And I think I said, like, imagine, you know, I feel like in a few years I could be into this role. And look at where I am. So that was fun. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it's really cool. Um, last year I stepped into youth working in term three. So I came towards the end of the year, but. Um, yeah, so I'm just feeling so privileged to be in this role to um, total students and um, kids in our community um, and just develop relationships and connections with our youth um, and empowering them through um, Itu Tangata and just kind of teaching them what that looks like and um, supporting them in all areas, but um, mostly like well-being and stuff like that. Um, and just really building and creating that uplifting culture because um, I've seen a lot in these new generations just to kind of um, put down, you know, like kind of negative um, influence they have on each other. So just coming in there and just, you know, encouraging them to, you know, um, the way they speak to each other and act towards each other, just, um, yeah, encouraging them to be kind and caring and, um, you know, their school values and stuff. Um, so some of the things that I kind of stepped into initially was mentoring. Um, for me, it was a big step, but very privileging. Um, I still remember my first ever mentoring um, session with one of the girls, and she, you know, unloaded some pretty heavy stuff. And I had just, you know, asked her, like, have you talked to an adult about this? Or, you know, have you talked to anyone about this? And she said, no, I haven't talked to anyone about this since I was, you know, now to my heart, but um, just to have the opportunity to be there for these kids and just be accessible and um, available for them, um, you know, and just knowing that for them that there's someone that they can go and talk to in school or just connect with or, um, you know, for someone like me to just emphasise their value that they have. Um, and yeah, and I'm not just, you know, there for mentoring, but I help in class. So I'll go and support the teachers, but also um, students that really struggle with learning. So sometimes I'll notice, or sometimes I just move around and just, um, yeah, total call of their work with them and work through it with them. Um, I mean, the last week, this boy really doesn't like work. So I stayed behind while the rest of the class went out and did fitness. And I was just sitting there and just going through what the teacher had said, but a lot slower for him because, you know, he couldn't keep up with the work. So um, just little stuff like that, that I would have really appreciated um, in, high school, uh, in primary school and high school too. Um, yeah, and I guess another example is just supporting teachers and students to, you know, get along because um, I had a girl who's just really struggling to get along with her teacher and just talking about, you know, respect and the, the values that they both can contribute and um, show each other um, and just working through that with her. Um, 
as well as kids that don't really enjoy school and just kind of reminding them of why it's good to be at school and um, what connections you can make and um, yeah just kind of supporting them through that um, before going off to high school especially which is even more daunting <laughs> for them um, and I've been involved in a range of things like camp and athletics day which has been really cool to see the kids come out of their shell and a lot of them is out of the comfort zone I mean sports isn't for everyone um, but just encouraging them to give it a go and get involved um, and yeah that's all been in my short while of being a youth worker so I can't wait to see what um, more I can bring in the future and I'm really hoping to um, start up some programs just to continue to uplift their um, development themselves and also their well well-being. So yeah, Nam he, thank you for your time. Kia ora, I'm um, Nikki. I'm at Alice Mead College and I just started my sixth year there. Um, we've also got Ben who's um, just started his fourth year out there. I'd like to really um, highlight um, what we do is not necessarily um, seen as a, a daily impact, but a, um, a walking through with students um, through their school life and out into uh, the workforce or further study. Um, so I'd like to talk you through um, one particular student that um, we've both been working with. I met him five years ago when I first started at college. He entered as a new year seven as well. And um, this boy was very timid. He didn't say virtually any words to anyone, didn't speak to his peers, struggled to communicate with his teachers. Um, and it was just, so I took the time to make sure I'd always check in with him, um, acknowledge him if, if I saw him around school, um, sit next to him in class, and really make him feel noticed and valued. Now, this is a kid who comes from a bit of a high-risk background, so he had other things going on. Um, so, um, eventually, taking the time to have these quite one-sided conversations, to be honest, um, eventually, over the next year or two, I start to get a few words here and there, maybe some quirky expressions and grins and every now and then, um, just a bit of interaction, um, which was quite a big win. Um, so after a few years, I started getting some more sentences, bouncing back with each other with all the conversations, which is incredible and really great for his teachers and his peers to be able to start doing that with them too. But it wasn't just for me, it was starting to grow his confidence. Um, yeah, so he really felt that we wanted to actually get to know him and we really valued him. Um, last year, he got the invitation to go to the Berlin military camp to take part in a blue light um, skills program. And not only did he complete that um, successfully, he also took away the award for the most improved student on that course. Um, also last year, um, we went and watched him perform um, in the school production where he played the narrator for the entire production. So this obviously entailed quite a bit of talking in front of an audience. Um, since all this time, he has um, got this passion now to want to show his leadership skills and he's suddenly realised that he has had it all along. And um, just this week, he is actually joining a buddy program that we run at school where we pair up year seven students, the new year seven students who are a bit anxious with a year 12 or 13. He's now year 12. And he's put his hand up to link up with one of these new students and pair with them through the school and walk them through a journey with them, communicating and making them feel less anxious. So having people invest time into him grow, his confidence has completely changed who he is today. Um, he has not only got the ability to communicate confidently, but he's able to bring that out on others. And we see that as a real win. And it may not be the, the academic or the sports or all those other things, but it's actually the personal things um, that are the real wins that are going to take him forward and he's going to be able to achieve highly. And we see that a lot in our youth. And it is a time thing. It's not a this week, next month, it's a we walk through with them. Yeah. Okay. Kia ora koutou, ko manu haramatuku ingwa. 
I'm, I'm part of the Ralston School, Ralston College 24 7 teams, uh, which is a privilege. And thank you very much for the input, financial input that you guys give to us to achieve that. Um, two things. The, we did a survey last year, all youth workers, all schools that youth workers are in, did a survey with 20 students just to see the impact because we wanted the honest truth. So we got the schools to pick these students, not us, because I'm going to pick my favourites. We got the schools to pick them because we want to see where we're heading at and where we're not. So I can share that out or we can email all of them to somebody um, later on. I was going to share a bit of a holistic view on youth work as a 10-hour role inside a school, but then that role actually moves into the community through being local. So local is very important to us. Um, so we will move into the local sports clubs or whatever it is we're participating in. But we're also running the local youth groups that then flow into the other things that um, last year I had the privilege of facilitating with Bruce Ward, the local community constable, um, a meeting with uh, about 15 parents that come along. And these 15 parents, um, their young people are causing a lot of the social issues in this community. A lot of them are doing burglaries and all that. So we, we sat in a room and we had a conversation about how do we support this. So that, that flows on from those connections inside a school that then flows out into the playground, the sports field, wherever it may be, into the youth groups, and then it, we're flowing into the communities. Through that, we've been able to support some of those families through, um, for us at Hope Church, we run a workshop so we can support that. And it's just connecting. Yes, we are youth workers. But we're here to support a family and a community. And if we can be in that, hand holding, we're not professionals at a lot of these things. We're just hand holders to support them along to whatever it is that they need to achieve bigger and better things in their uh, lives, their futures. Um, yeah, so that was me. Hopefully, that got the holistic thing happening. Thanks. I think that's the thing about these youth workers is they're, they're not the ones who have all the skills to do it, but uh, they're not the teachers, they're not the counsellors, they're not someone big and scary, they're someone who can simply listen and walk alongside young people and go, can I walk with you as we go to a counsellor? Can I walk with you as we go and find support from a church? Can I walk with you as we do that? And it's that consistency over long periods of time that we see um, real impact with our young people. It's not ever going to be a one term or one year or one week. It's going to be years and years before we really see the impact of what these guys are doing on the ground today and our young people who are going to be our future parents, our future leaders and business owners, all those other things. So, no re raka nui te mihi ki a koutou katoa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Kia ora. Thank you for coming in here today. Um, it's obvious the passion that the four of you had for what you do. Um, I'd, uh, you know, and I'd also like to thank you on behalf of your community and, and our youth for the work that you do, because sometimes, as you say, you're untrained in a lot of this, and it, it must be reasonably stressful for you at times, so carry on with the good work. Thank you. Okay. And thank you. Sam, you had... Yeah, oh, just say thank you for what you were born in. I used to be working with 24-7 for about 10 years, and um, just know the impact that you are all making uh, on young people's lives, both individually and as groups. I want to say thank you for the permission that you have garnered from young people to be um, so open with you. Uh, and as you've just said, to walk to the professional help when required, but also just to build relationships and friendship with, with young people who are really needing it. Uh, our community at the moment is, young people's population is growing significantly. Uh, and the challenges that that poses continue to grow as well. And so I'm interested in um, the the new ways that you think we might be able to work with be able to support the, the different range of young people's needs. Um, Denise has already talked to us about um, what other social services we might be able to get in here, but uh, do you have a view on the things that young people most need if we were to target government um, services to be present uh, and so on? Um, yeah, I actually talked to Denise um, and the Youth Hub. I think it's a fantastic idea. And just listening to the college and the um, what well, they've been able to do with the young people to put them into um, youth and youth pathways being out here in the alternative education I think is a great, great thing because we're all working together and it's not, we're not 
what are we not doing? We're not working on our own, trying to achieve our own things. We're trying to be you know, the young person, which I think is fantastic. I'm curious as to a little bit the school counsellor. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I'd say that would be fantastic to have those services. Yeah, um, and then lastly, for me, I met with the four principals of the high schools last week, and they all talked about how good 24 7 was. And I know that Darfield's currently looking to employ someone to be in the school there too. So, uh, from the principal. Yeah, Kia ora koutou. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's lovely to see you back in the video. <laughs> and we used to be on our student youth council, so we youth council, which is great. Um, so, yeah, uh, my question is kind of reflecting back to a conversation that you guys probably weren't here for at the beginning of the meeting, which was regarding the use of the word or the translation of the word karakia in our standing orders because it mentioned prayer and the discussion revolved around us being a secular organization. Um, and I know I've mentioned this before, but it does still disturb me a little that um, while you do fantastic work 24 seven is at its core still about churches working in schools and not just every church, it is very specific churches. Um, and you do great work, but I can't help but think that you could be even better. And I was wondering if at a national level they have thought about, I wouldn't say disconnecting from churches because that is, that's the foundation of um, the entire organisation. But at least broadening the scope of recruitment um, and particularly, you know, the comment around being untrained. So that's, that's, a, that's a limitation on perspective and qualification and it's a really critical service that you're providing and to be honest one of the reasons why i'm excited about the youth hub is because that seriously broadens the range of perspectives that our kids have access to um so yeah i'm just wondering if there's if there's anything going on in that space thanks Chara, thank you for the question um so I want to speak on behalf of 24-7 um as, as a national one i can speak on behalf of some of the, the trust and the work that we're doing out here um we, we are uh, youth work on local churches. That is, the, that is the foundation of what we do. We're unashamed about that. Um, the, the way 24-7 has come into so many of these schools is because schools have approached us, have approached local churches, have approached 24-7 and said, we want your youth workers in our school. And so it's not been us going to school saying, hey, we've got this great thing, can we be here? But so often it's the principals and schools going, we recognize, we know who you are, we know the program, we know your foundations, we would like you in our school. And so taking that invitation, also realizing we're one youth work agency. So we're one network of youth workers. There's so many other incredible youth working networks um, and providers throughout um, Aotearoa. Um, and so we are just one part of that. We see our, our connection with the church as part of the wider community as an incredibly vital and important to who we are. Um, so I don't believe that would be a conversation. It's certainly not around separating from that. Um, but I understand um, your concerns for that. Just thank you. Thank you for coming. I, I, uh, I appreciate that you we had to have a bit of a change around in terms of dates and time. So thanks for coming along. And I just note that as one of those organisations funded under that fund, um, you are very active in ensuring that you do come along and present back to council. And that's, that's um, greatly appreciated as is the work that you do. So right. thanks. Thank you for your time. Right. I'd like to now break for morning tea and uh, there's a one report to do when we come back so uh, we'll do that and and you're welcome to stay for morning tea if you'd like to
Yeah, that your contribution about that was going to go up. Yes, now I'm sorry. The reason might be more appropriate is to advise on the response with our.
Okay, if we can start again. Um, would someone like us to move the last report that we've just been through? Uh, Denise's report, Shane and Phil. All those in favour? I imagine it's carried. And Denise, I'll get you to do the next report. Okay, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I'll just use the opportunity to um, ask Nicola to come up and uh, introduce herself to you. Uh, particularly, she will have a, a focus on a number of the strategies and reports that you're seeing in this report. Um, and, um, and she can speak to, to some of those. Uh, what I've got in front of you uh, is a, a schedule of the of the reports that we anticipate bringing to you over the course of this the next um, the remainder of the calendar year, so that there so that you are aware of when things are scheduled and um, and when they're scheduled to be reported on. In addition to that, there will be opportunities where we do deep dives into different aspects of um, community services and facilities delivery so that you can have a more in-depth uh, understanding of some uh, aspect uh, or some team within the, within the group. And also we will look to schedule a range of site visits that will also help inform your understanding and awareness and the context, I guess, within which some of these reports are presented. So that's the purpose of, of this report. And the second purpose of this report is also uh, uh, to just um, go through the, the work plans of the respective heads and draw your attention to how you can expect to be re have reports uh, or be, be given updates on the various activities within work planning. So some of the activities will simply be reported within our quarterly all of group uh, reports uh, and others will be reported on as part of the deep dive presentation and others will be a, a specific report. So it just is intended to give you some confidence that the things we're working on will be when you can expect to get some updated information around what's going on in that space so that um, you, you, you can direct your inquiries and questions in that, in that direction. Nicola, I'll just invite you to talk to some of the, the specific strategies that, that we would expect to go by this committee on which to council that you're involved with. Thank you and hello everyone. I'm Nicola Sutton and I'm the Community Policy Advisor in the Community Strategy and Policy team uh, that has been established in the restructure. Um, Denise has uh, explained the schedule of reports and I just wanted to make note um, in the destinations there that there are a number of uh, reports and strategies and plans uh, that are going to council uh, after going to this committee. So just for you to be aware of, um, and I'll we'll focus a little bit more on those. Um, so the schedule of, of reports are here, but of course, acknowledging the fact that there may or, or is likely to be work that uh, comes up through the year uh, from council that uh, will be added into the schedule. So I think what would be useful is to just focus you on to the schedule of project information, which is four, and it's here where you start to see the key projects for the 23-24 year um, by the various work teams, and I thought I would cover off uh, the ones in, this, in the um, community strategy and policy section that has the green bar down the side. 
um, of, of uh, that because it's these that are likely to carry on through to council. Um, and so some of the strategies that are underway or planned for uh, include the sport recreation and play strategy, which uh, is likely to come in the second quarter of the year. At the moment, it's scheduled for May uh, and work has begun on that. But there are other strategies, including the economic development action plan, um, the community wellbeing strategy, which Denise spoke about in answer to a question earlier today, um, that being scheduled for September. Uh, there is work, uh, several pieces of work happening around sponsorship, one of them in relation to Foster Park sponsorship uh, that will be coming up in March, and um, a briefing to council in May around sports field lighting. Um, there's also work taking place on the accessibility and access audit, uh, the customer experience survey, so that's the annual survey we do uh, with customers in relation to um, the community halls, pools, uh, sports centre and um, libraries and service centres and uh, one of the focus areas in that is around whether the community um, or the customers are uh, benefiting from a wellbeing perspective from these facilities. Um, we had uh, a, a good response to this last year and we're expecting to see a good response this year and it will be useful to also take a look and see um, how data is trending uh, because this will be the third time that this, that particular survey has been done. So that will be available to um, Council in June and it's used by the managers of the various uh, service areas in order to plan your work but also to look for improvements and how they support uh, the customer experience from, from um, our ratepayers and visitors. Uh, there will also be some work around the future of the Rolleston Community Centre towards the end of the year, so we'll be looking at um, how the Integrated Youth Hub and the Arts Focus has gone in those areas and providing um, opportunity to report there. So, uh, there are also other reports and strategies in here that uh, the community strategy and policy team will have input to, but I think useful for council to just also be looking ahead to the bicultural strategy and the bilingual signage report um, from the Te Pai Mata Aho. Uh, so um, any questions or anything, Denise, you would like me to touch on that? Thank you. Uh, your yeah, question is around, uh, that's good, it's really nice to have the clarity around what's coming and where it's coming from and, uh, and its timing, so thank you for this report. Uh, at the end of last year, there was a discussion about signage on Te Ara Atia, uh, and I'm just wondering where that and other types of um, work that has already begun, but now kind of fits pretty easily within one of the committees where that will happen, or are you envisaging that will still happen at a council meeting? So uh, specifically in relation to the uh, to what you talked about in terms of the Tiara Atia, that sits for us within a bilingual um, uh, report that is due to come to council. The timing of it is because we think it is important that um, the Poahuria is involved with the presentation and she's not going to be available in the, uh, the early, any earlier than that timing in terms of presenting it. Um, yeah, so that, so that will pick up specifically around wayfinding within facilities, the process around naming some key and the process of naming some key strategic facilities. Um, the other comments that you made, one of them I was thinking before as well, because you did talk about the dark sky reserve and wanting a report on that. So that's um, that I'll take that offline and have a conversation with my colleague Tim about whether that sits in his space or our space and as long as as, as long as you get a report I guess that's all that, that matters in terms of that so we'll come back to you around that and what was that for Hi. Um, so the uh, similar question to what I asked before I guess and it's around um well first of all our conversation during the during the, during the break the theater underworld is already working on getting some information for you. I've activated it through this device here. Fantastic. Um, the, uh, the question, I guess, is, is uh, two things. One around the Ross and Community Centre, and you made a comment about the arts um, stuff going on. there. really interested to know a bit more about that. But again, about um, how the performing arts fits into this whole sort of um, uh, that community strategy and policy. 
um, as I mentioned before, there's an abundance of sporting activity, which is snuck in there in, in addition to the sports page. So, yeah, mm. you want to comment on that? Um, I think Denise, in reply to one of your questions earlier, was around whether the um, strategy on community wellbeing, whether that um, may be broadened to take that into consideration. So we'll um, certainly uh, talk about that and, and about where that could fit. Mm. Okay, well, thank you, Mr Chair. And just a little bit further to Sam's conversation around bilingual signage, I think it's important to um uh, to bring into perspective, I guess, and it's going a little bit wider is to understand that there's uh, uh, two rules um, by the treaty over here, and that there's different perspectives that uh, deserve consideration and respect. Um, Denise and I have had the conversation, so in particular moving forward, I think it's um, a good thing to have bilingual signage because that's, you know, the right respectful thing to do as partners within the treaty partnership, but also allows for the understanding of uh, both worlds. Um, there's three particular words. There's uh, the colour, which are the rules, um, the tikanga, which is a process, and um, there's another one that I can't quite think of, but all of those views are then brought into the process that we come out with this bilingual um, signage policy or whatever it might look like. I think it's quite important to have that discussion soon, uh, that we adopt the tikanga and colour within to our own practices, because then we can be the advocates to our community and the understanding of how all this signage uh, or how the name is gifted to particular facilities, especially as we're looking forward to the Leaston project. So I'm quite excited. I think it's an opportunity for us to grow, to learn, and to become closer together as a you know a nation within the, a district within the nation, or the other way around. So I try to say thank you. Yeah. Would someone like to move that we receive this report? No. No comments. Yeah. Sam, all those in favour? Against? No. Okay. Carried. Um, I just um, but don't want to hold up the meeting, Mr Chair, but there are some sign-off um, titles that are increased. So without, um, so if I can just be given the liberty of just uh, changing that offline um, so that it would be accurate in what gets finally produced in terms of the minutes. Okay, that's fine, yep. And I'll ask you to just kind of here. Uh, so just in the absence of a um, formally agreed uh, closing karakia, um, there's uh, a, a closing karakia has been circulated around the room and everyone is invited to join in, um, but I will lead off with Unuhia, Unuhia, Unuhia ki te uru taku nui, ki a wātia, ki a māma, te nākau, te tīnāna, te wairua i te ara tākata. Koya ra e rō, a kairiri a, a ki e ki runa, ki a tina, tina, huye, tāna ki e.